I'm Carol Peterson, and welcome to our YouTube channel. I'm here with Jeff Peoples. The YouTube channel is Human Aging Finally Solved. I met Jeff uh, first through his book on vitamin D, but he's had a passion for solving the riddle of aging, which he calls a Rubik's Cube, which has many movable parts. He's the author of this book, The Unselfish Genome. He does a little parody on Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene. How Darwin and Dawkins missed the second half of the theory of evolution. What we'd like to do with these uh, YouTubes is talk about the many parts tied into Jeff's theory of what's happening with aging. And as he will tell you, he's, he's like a lone wolf crying out in the wilderness. We're going to be specifically talking about a little piece today that he calls apes, which has to do with aging, sex, predation, and extinction. Uh, Jeff Bowles has uh, been a, a writer. He's published many papers and books, and he is one of these few individuals who doesn't have a lot of letters behind his name, but he's a, he's a thinking and a searching person, and he's got a lot to share with us. So welcome, Jeff. Um, you've also, Hello. You've also called yourself a paleontologist, and I love that because you are digging in the medical literature as your soil. <laughs> yeah, that, that was, uh, I just recently um, uh, published a blog post that uh, explains how I think I've finally solved the Rubik's Cube of aging. And two new studies came out that confirmed everything, almost everything I had written in a 1998 uh, journal article that was published back then that basically... It, uh, it, I, I decided to retire early in my early mid twenties because I'd made enough money to get by, and and I thought, why am I wasting all of my time uh, making money? I'm just going to die someday. And it, I think most businessmen should give that a good thought because uh, they spend all their time on that, and then they're just going to get old and die. But so I, I just, I just. <laughs> So I thought I was pretty good at those. I mean, I was at the point where even in my 20s, I was at the point where I could almost put together deals that would build high rises. I was doing like really well. And uh, I just pretty much walked away from it, went back to school to study biochem and see if I could uh, contribute anything to solving the question of, you know, how and why we age and how to stop it. And so I spent about 10 years in the Northwestern Med School Library, because I was an alum, I went to the business school there, so I had an alumni card, and I just started gathering all the pieces of the puzzle of aging that I could find in all these medical journals, assembling them like uh, puzzle pieces, but that's where you got the term paleontologist, because I, <laughs> in that blog post, I said I was like the first paleontologist who had dug up a whole complete set of dinosaur bones, was trying to put them together and see what it came up with and uh so, the first so you came up you came up with some very different conclusions than oh, what right, is right. So acceptable to the scientific world I'm gonna expand on that <laughs> well just i'm gonna just that paleontologist quote was like i put the dinosaur bones together a few were like in a little wrong place kind of like the first paleont paleontologist that put the bones together they were a little bit off but you could tell it was a dinosaur mm -hmm. so that's that's what my paper was like and I published it and I had put all those pieces together without ever thinking aging was uh an accident accidental artifact of us living too long I just always assumed it was programmed so I'd never really read any of the theory papers that were out there which is mm -hmm. I guess I guess kind of odd to spend 10 years on something and uh -huh. not even look at the theory and so i finally came to the conclusion aha all these puzzle pieces fit together it turns out aging is programmed it's controlled by your hormones uh it's also driven by the same thing that causes you to, to become a a young child 
the development program that turns you from a baby into a child and then a child into a sexually mature adult in my my the puzzle was telling me that the same uh, thing is working after you become a sexually mature adult and it's actually killing you through the development aging program it's one and the same so i published this long paper it was 70 pages it was seven times longer than the limit for uh, the science journal mm -hmm. and they ex they accepted it as is anyway and uh, gave it they said it was extremely exciting and of major importance now the, this journal wasn't stocked up with uh, regular scientists in the field of aging or evolutionary biologists they're more more like doctors it was called medical hypotheses so they liked it and uh so i published it and then i, I got a a lot of requests from around the world for copies of it. They send you a little card, like a yeah. reprint request. Yeah. <laughs> then, then I started interacting with aging scientists and evolutionary biologists, and they were just laughing at me. I was the laughing stock. They told me, oh, you don't know how evolution works. Um, and, you know, uh, one guy, one aging scientist wrote, he said, uh, he wrote a paper about my programmed aging paper and a couple other guys that were interested in programmed aging and said it was uh he didn't want to waste his time uh it was aubrey de gray i'm sure you've heard of him yes yes uh yeah, so he, maybe say say just a word a few words about him because he may not be from a familiar name to everybody yeah, he's this guy that's uh, running around saying, oh, we're going to cure aging, uh, even though it's it's not programmed, it's caused by DNA damage, but we're going to learn how to put that firecracker that's exploded back together. So he's talking out of both sides of his mouth, like, oh, how complicated it is on one side, on the other side. Oh, send me some money to my SCNS, <laughs> Center Sense Research Foundation, and we're going to figure out how to put this exploded firecracker back together and we'll have a cure for aging in no time. And he's got this big, long beard. And uh, when he talks, he's, uh, I don't want to insult okay. him, but he, <laughs> he talks really fast. It's kind of hard to an, enough on, follow. Uh, enough on Aubrey. <laughs> Aubrey, all right. Well, he wrote this paper that was published uh -huh. in a science journal in 2006 about my paper on aging and Josh mm -hmm. Middledorf's and Ted Goldsmith's in a, couple others just there's only a few of us programmed aging theorists and he said I don't want, even want to spend the time reading these papers uh, because I know it's like a perpetual motion machine that it's impossible <laughs> so why should I waste my time <laughs> he's, a, he's urging any young scientist would do well to not read these papers and and, and get 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 lost and confused oh that's that's terrible so I'd like to say one thing about scientific method you look at a lot of data um, it's based on observation. You form a hypothesis that this is the thing and it develops further into a theory. And a theory is something for the scientific community to examine and examine for faults. And one of the things about your hypothesis or theory, I'm not sure what the distinction is, uh, you are Pre able oh. to pull together a lot of loose ends that simply aren't covered with the other thought that uh, aging is just a matter of environmental damage, uh, changes to DNA mutations and things like that. You have a theory that pretty much is uh, embracing a lot of things that uh, these guys dismiss. So do you wanna address some of that? Or do you wanna go into yeah. the- Oh, sh sure, the, I'll, let me just give you a brief the, rundown on that. So, okay. um, so they've been, I've been ridiculed mercilessly by evolutionary biologists when I first was approaching them with my paper and aging scientists. Leonard Hayflick was head of experimental gerontology. He wrote me a three page handwritten paper like, you don't know the first thing about aging. <laughs> okay, now Hayflick, uh, no, no. Hayflick has oh, yeah. a Hayflick limit. Yeah, uh, right, he's, uh, he's famous for, they right. call it the Hayflick limit. It means uh, in the old days they thought cell, skin cells and human cells could divide forever in a Petri dish mm -hmm. and Hayflick, this, he, his huge discovery that made him famous 
was he discovered that, uh, that, that the human cells can only divide like 40 times and then they stop. And what he discovered was they, in the prior, the prior scientists had been feeding these, uh, human skin cell cultures with, uh, chicken fibroblasts uh, were somehow in the mix of the food that they were mm-hmm. feeding these cells. And it was actually the chicken fibroblasts that kept uh, uh, kept dividing and mm-hmm. they long after the human cells had died. So basically uh, Leonard figured out the uh, chicken fibroblast problem. That's his. <laughs> <language>. <laughs> <laughs> So, and that made him the head of experimental gerontology, the, the big magazine, our big science journal. So amazing. So, so, yeah, so, so go ahead. You heard oh, from right. him so, and you heard from some other people. Yeah, they're like, no, aging could not be programmed. It's not, you know, there's all, there's a hundred years of writings by these evolutionary biologists and they, they just all believe in their hearts that it's caused by accidental DNA damage. And, and uh, so... But by them avoiding the idea that aging is programmed, they have to hide a whole bunch of evidence uh, that that totally uh, contradicts their theory. For example, um, there's a, the Pacific salmon will uh, it's it mates it swims up river after three years it goes out on the ocean goes back to its birthplace it mates over a three-day period and rapidly ages and dies like within a day or two after mating or depositing the eggs that's obviously programmed aging so and there's other examples of that in nature they call so they decide well we're not going to call that aging we're going to call it a special category semiparous aging which means related to reproduction and we can put all those aging examples of programmed aging there and ignore them. So that, <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, another thing they ignore is uh, um, me- female menopause. Like, are, so the reason aging can't exist or could not have been selected for in the minds of evolutionary biologists is because um, in their world, everything is driven by the selfish gene. The selfish gene just wants to make more and more copies of itself. And if aging was programmed and evolved, that's something that sto- that reduces that your, your contribution of genes to the gene pool. And so that makes no sense. It's not possible. That's not how evolution works. So all they think of is the selfish gene. And I got all these examples like, well, what about things that reduce the spread of the selfish gene? For example, female menopause, you know, and they conveniently ignore that. They say, well, that's not related to aging. And they right, come up so with we're this. We're no longer contributing to that gene pool. Right. And you can live, a, <laughs> live up to 120 years uh, after, you know, like uh, you can live up to 70 years longer after menopause. They have no explanation for that other than, oh, possibly uh, the the grandmother helps the daughter uh, care for the young and it increases their survival. And that's been shown to be untrue in, in like indigenous uh, uh, humans that live in the jungle. And that's pretty much a discredited theory, but that's all they have for menopause. I mean, it's, it's, it's simplistic and ridiculous. When I first read your book. I, I say menopause is programmed. It's, yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> for a reason. So, okay, we'll, we'll oh. get there. But when, when I first read your book, one of the things that really dazzled me and, and certainly was an area of ignorance was in the whole of living things, plants and animals and humans, if we want to do a separate category, there is a great different number of lifespans in all those things. There's long-lived and short-lived species. So one of the things that's interesting to me is that your theory embraces all of this. So would you like to go into some of these examples? Because I was astounded. The oldest animals, the oldest trees, the the jellyfish that never dies, uh, quite, quite astounding information. And then I wonder if some of our research that we're doing on human aging, because we're most interested in that, of course, 
we're ignoring the clues from all of nature that you have pulled into your theory. Actually, yeah, the way I, I mean, I'm looking through every anomaly I can find that's odd in nature and my theory has no loose ends. There's, there really aren't any. And the mainstream evolution th evolutionary community has all sorts of loose ends. They can't explain sex. Uh, they can't explain aging. They can't explain differences in lifespan between species. So if, let's get to that for a moment. Um, so I, after I figured out that aging is programmed, then they're telling me, uh, well, and I don't know how evolution works. So I started looking <laughs> into evolution mm -hmm. and I, I had to figure out what they were getting wrong. Mm -hmm. And so I really did a deep dive into evolution theory. And so I'm looking at it from the perspective of aging. So like, uh, generally there's a relationship where you can start based on body size in mammals and in most animals that where the smaller the animal, the shorter the lifespan. And it's like a mouse will get old and die in about two years, three years. Uh, maybe a, a rabbit or a squirrel might li live six or seven years tops. Then you get to uh, a dog like 10, 12 years, bigger dogs. Um, and then you got the horse that's 40 years old. They, they, that's the maximum. And the elephants get up to 65 years. So it's kind of a straight line that goes up. I think it, it tops out at the whale. You know, the big whale can live, a, I don't know, 100, 150 years. And then you got your Galapagos tour. Oh, so now you've got exceptions to this line. Uh-huh. And I, that's... How are you explaining that? Well, that's what, get, that's what tells you what's going on. Or, uh -huh. or, so there's... Uh, a small bat, the size of a mouse, it's called the myotis bat. And that can live like 41 years is the maximum lifespan. So that's way off the line. Mm -hmm. um, you have uh, little box tortoises. They can live yes. 100, 120 years. That's way off the line. Um, you've got human beings. I mean, based on our body size, we should live no longer than maybe... 15 years we should be old and dead but for some reason we can live as long as 120 mm -hmm. and then you've got uh lobsters which aren't that big and they can live 200 years and then you've got tiny little uh tiny little arctic clams i, I forgot the how the name is pronounced like a quahog or something mm -hmm. but they, they live way up in the icy waters of the arctic and they can live like five six hundred years and they're like only two inches tall so oh the, que the question <laughs> is you got to ask yourself what do all these animals that have exceptionally long lifespans what do they all have in common can you guess um i could i could give it away because i read oh, it. oh you read it <laughs> I, I posed this question to a bunch of <laughs> evolutionary professors. I had a big mailing list uh -huh. and none of them could guess. And then one guy made fun of me, uh, Richard Miller from University of Michigan. He's like, well, I guess they all make good soups except for bats. <laughs> <laughs> but actually they do eat bat soup in China and Guam, uh -huh. which is kind of disgusting. So he thought he'd be funny at my expense. And he's one of the professors that now doesn't want to hear from me or he doesn't make fun, fun of me anymore. Um, mm -hmm. He's, I'm, I, I, I used to be his laughing stock and now I'm his worst nightmare. Cause it, these, all these scientists are used to getting like A's on their tests in school and having their science fair projects, getting A plus. And this is, I'm giving them their, their first F they've ever gotten in their life. <laughs> <laughs> they don't like, they don't like it. Okay. So what all these animals that, that live so long, oh, and birds, there's some birds that can live like 90 years. Like they live longer, like parrots can live older than, uh, longer than their owners. Um, yep. There's a fulmar in the ocean that lives, it mostly lives flying, uh, it's, it's the size of a seagull and it mostly lives like flying around and only uh, it lands in the water to give birth or, or on a steep sea cliff, uh, you know, very isolated on a, a horizontal cliff. 
and they give birth and they don't show any signs of aging. You know, the, they've got pictures of an aging researcher banding one of these birds when he was 20 and he's young and he comes back to see the bird like 45 years later, he's older. Mm -hmm. and the bird's, com bird's completely the same with no, no sign of aging. And then eventually they just drop dead without any signs of aging once they hit their limit. Oh, the that's one interesting. One thing they, they all have in common, and there's more other examples of this, is they all have good defenses to uh, predators. Mm -hmm. So flying, uh, it's hard to catch a bird or generally. Um, uh, some birds here in the city, they're, they can get caught by cats, but you know, there's a lot of birds. The, the birds that live really long also live isolated lives, like uh, the fulmar lives out on the ocean away from any other predators and uh, almost never goes to land except to uh, uh, lay an egg for a while. Um, the uh, lobster and the, the tortoise, they live so long, they have full body armor. Mm -hmm. I, once, I used to watch a lot of nature shows and I saw a lion trying to eat a turtle or a tortoise and they, they just gave up. <laughs> and, well, that'll and, work. Yeah, and then bats. And, and what, what is it we have? Uh, extreme intelligence. So if, if you're a lion trapped in a room uh, with various animals, you, you couldn't catch the bird because it would fly up high. Mm -hmm. uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't eat that uh, tortoise. He would just ball up and the human would probably kill you with a spear. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so the, yeah, so once a, a species evolves of excellent defense to predators, um, then, then it can live a longer lifespan and it's only limited by the, uh, how, how it ages. So a lot okay, more, like, like, more animals me, die of old age. Yeah. And then, then let me can... ask here. Uh, so we have things like trees, we have redwoods, uh, sequoias or whatever that have enormous all years right. of lifetime that, that the we've discovered. The tree but, of eternal life. Right. Well, they're, they're stuck in one place. Um, yeah. Wouldn't it be easy to uh, chew on them and eat them and eradicate them? Or what? How are, how are those plant world life how do, forms protecting how do they live themselves? So long? Yeah. What well, are their predators? Or how do they well, avoid their predators? If you've lived 3,000 years, you obviously don't have any predators. <laughs> Just, and uh, same with the. Uh, and there's a creosote bush in the middle of the desert. It can live 10,000 years, maybe longer. Some, and then there's uh, like juniper trees that can live 10,000 years, cedar trees. What's interesting is all the trees that have like really huge lifespans, um, the only thing that can kill them is like lightning, falling over, or humans. And we, we've decided to protect them mostly. But if you go to the Home Depot or garden store you will find uh they sell mulch in of different kinds like cedar a redwood mm -hmm. all the mulches they sell come from very long-lived trees and that's because uh th there's no insects that can uh deal with their poison there's a uh, dr stephen gundry who's written a lot about plant lectins and he says that um, plants do not want to be eat, eaten. They they want to kill you. So you have to keep that in mind. Uh, when... <laughs> well, that's true. There's. Uh, I was looking into like how do plants deal with predators, and, and I, I there was this one thing where some trees were when the animals start to uh, eat their leaves or whatever, mm -hmm. they put out these chemical signals to the other trees, and then they all start making like extra poisons. Interesting. Yeah. So even though you're stuck in place, you, you've learned how to deal with predators. And even if it's us wanting to eat uh, beans and rice or a salad. <laughs> right, right. Well, they do produce fruits that they want the animals to take with them to spread mm -hmm. their seeds. So you shouldn't be afraid of fruits or beans or, or things that are if they want you to disperse the seeds, they should not be poisonous. They so should, be, we, we've should be healthy. See that as a plant predator because we start cooking things or um, yes. um, using other other techniques. Again, a sign of our intelligence is being uh, 
a, a good predator? Uh, well, yeah, I guess, but I, to think uh, predators, most predators, even the good ones, they, they, they tip, tend to stay on that body size lifespan continuum. So, you know, if you, th you think a alligator or a lion is such a good predator, it hasn't, it hasn't led to them getting increased lifespans compared to other animals. But um, yeah, so basically I figured out that aging is a defense to predation, which I mean, so you work backwards. If, if you don't have any predators, you can live a long lifespan then, then what is the evolutionary purpose of aging? So you work backwards. The mm -hmm. purpose of aging is to protect the species from predators. So at first blush, that sounds a little hard to figure out. But I looked at it and it turns out that um, evolution uh, once favors diversity in the gene pool. So let's say a prey species of uh, oh, before we get to that, I, we need to add sex because sex and aging are two sides to the same coin. Okay. So let's go through the sex part first and then we'll wrap it all up. Okay. All right. So another th big problem with the uh, mainstream evolution uh, communities uh, theory about uh, aging and sex is, uh, uh, or, or the selfish gene is not only aging, uh, inhibits your contribution to the gene pool sex cuts your contribution to the gene pool by 50 percent by being male and female sex types so plus you it may, more than 50 percent because you can't just reproduce you, if, if you could yeah you couldn't reproduce yourself by snapping your fingers you got to go find a mate if you're a male you got to fight other males so it really cuts down on the spread of your genes and the best way to do it, uh, if the selfish gene was the only thing controlling evolution, would be just to be a female that can get pregnant on her own and just start having babies. So that sounds a little crazy, but that actually occurs in evolution uh, a lot more than you think. In fact, there's species of uh, animals that are entirely female, do not need males at all, and they can reproduce. Like there's there's certain walking stick insects that have been all female for a hundred million years. Mm -hmm. um, there's whiptail lizards in the Arizona desert. Uh, they're all females. They don't need any males. So they're, they're reproducing, they're passing on a hundred percent of their genes. So that they ignore, they ignore those cases completely. The, the ev evolutionary biologists don't want to talk about that because uh, they're, they're uh, and, oh, and then one of their famous uh, uh, came up with all these math models to try and explain sex. And on my blog post, you'll see uh, he looks kind of like a crazy scientist. And the quote below is, the hardest thing to explain in evolution is the existence of sex. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and they, they have all these crazy back wheel, cart flip math models to try and explain how sex uh, uh, has to exist. And they, they have no good explanation for it. And well, really well is if I could interject here, a while back, I read a book by Carl Zimmer called Parasite Rex. Yeah, that's one of their theories, but <laughs> parasites yeah, so, don't so have to kill you. He, he said we are in a constant push yeah, and shove with the parasitic world. Yeah, it's like the Red Queen hypothesis. You have <laughs> to keep running faster and faster just to stay in one place. I hold any water in my book because... The parasites don't have to kill you to uh, live off of you. The right. predator predator has to kill you. So that's not a good argument. Doesn't okay. Explain, okay. Doesn't explain anything. So, but um. So it's suggestion that we develop sexual reproduction, reproduction yeah, yeah, that's, instead that's, of that's, budding and splitting and whatnot. That's one um, of their. That's one of their. You know, like rickety ideas that they're trying to explain sex with, and. Uh, <laughs> So I figured it figured out since, oh yeah. And then there's a, a lot of animals uh, that don't need a male to reproduce such as like boa constrictors can just have female. If there's no male around, the female will have uh, identical female uh, babies. The turkey does it. Can you believe the turkey? Yeah, female I, turkey I can, can hardly believe that when I read it. 
yeah, there's the Komodo dragon. There's a lot of examples of this, and there's probably a lot more out that we don't even know about because they, you know, you have to test their DNA to see if they're clones. So it made me wonder, reading all that, if we're on that uh, continuum, we have um, off the. Oh, uh, right. <laughs> The scientists have actually reversed, mutated uh, some genes in a female mouse, and sh and she can now reproduce by herself clonally. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I read an article. I think it was in Popular Science, and they said, uh, "What are the odds that human females could uh, reproduce by cloning themselves?" Yeah. And they est they estimated it would take about a hundred reverse mutations in uh, some genes in females and they uh, human females could just start cranking out identical copies of themselves. So, and then uh, actually it does happen in human females. Uh, once in a while, their, uh, their ovum will just start repro start dividing like without us being fertilized by a male sperm. Uh huh. And it's, it's actually turning into a human being, but it's all messed up. And so they call them teratomas, like a, yeah. like a terrible cancer. But, and, and when they, when these women give birth to these little monsters, they have like hair and they might have a tooth here and there and a weird part of an eyeball and possibly a little bit of a nose sticking out and they look like little monsters and they won't show them to the mothers because it's too disturbing, but <laughs> I mean, we, um, so humans, one of our ancestors in the past had the ability for females to just uh, uh, clone themselves. So what this leads to is the fact that males are really unnecessary. And then probably the future of human evolution, there won't be any males long in the future. It'll just be humans eventually, human females cloning themselves. But according to your theory, that's putting that's us on the pathway to extinction. The problem with cloning is all the offspring are identical. Okay, so mm -hmm. that brings us back to the aging and the sex being, uh, oh, let me get, just throw in one little thing. What is the purpose of males? The males is to go, purpose of males is to go out with flashy colors on their back, make loud songs, uh, uh, do crazy dances, and that's all to attract the female, but it's also meant to attract predators. And the predators are supposed to kill the males that don't have the proper uh, survival genes. And so only the males that can survive predation, they come back and they get to fertilize all the females. And I wrote my book, It's Good to Be the King. <laughs> yeah, you, you mentioned that uh, women are attracted to older men. And well, yeah. So right here, it, because they've, uh, they've proved they have survived. Well, in addition to females being attracted to like rock rock stars and, you know, loud colors, long hair, yep. <laughs> uh, loud noises. Then there's other animals where the females are attracted to age markers that tell the female how old the male is. And that's kind of an indirect uh, indication of how well he survives uh, predation in the environment. So if the male has been able to live like a lot longer than other males, then that means he's, his genes are predator tested. And so that's the purpose of the, the beard on, the, on human males, because the younger males can't grow a long beard and mm -hmm. it keeps getting longer and longer until like until your late 30s. So that's really an age marker. So is gray hair. So uh, that explain, explains Aubrey de Grey. I always told Aubrey, I said, you wear your beard as a badge of ignorance. And every time you look <laughs> in the mirror, look at your beard and, and understand that you don't understand how evolution or aging works. <laughs> that's, his, that's his badge of ignorance. I even put his, I put his picture in my book as an example of uh, male, male sex traits uh, in, uh, in humans. So I had him there with his beard. I thought that would be fun. Yeah. So, but they're, but you know, like uh, female sharks, they prefer the much bigger male sharks to mate with. They don't want to mate with the, the little ones. Um, some females like much longer uh, horns, that, uh, like on a deer that grow longer and longer. So, so a lot of animals have age markers that tell the female that they're, they've been predator tested. Okay, so now we can get to, the, we can wind it up in the final package here. Okay. So the, uh, so it turns out 
both aging and sex are defenses to predation or predators. And how is that possible? So uh, the problem with a female cloning is that all the offspring are identical. And so if, if the group is exposed to a predator passing by from a different oh, environmental area, like a, a different ecosystem, let's say a new predator uh -huh. somehow makes it across the plains and finds a new colony of, uh, let's say, cloned rabbits, all female to eat. If he can kill one of them, he can kill all of them. And th then you go extinct. So if there's diversity in the uh, group uh, of rabbits, like there's some faster ones, there's ones that hide underground, there's darker colored ones. Uh, so you got a whole bunch of diversity in the gene pool and you won't get that from a, a female that clones herself. Uh, you get that when a male and a female mates and you're mixing up the genes 50, 50 and uh, any, so you get much more diversity in sexually reproducing uh, populations. Um, and that diversity will allow the group to survive encounters with uh, new predation or novel predation. So even if the predator can kill like 80% of the population, there's still 20% is different enough where they, they survive and are able to escape and they, they continue reconstituting the population with predator tested genes. So if it's all cloned females, they're all going to get eaten because he can eat one, he can eat them all. And then aging is, let's say you have several different females um, and they're all cloning slightly different. So you have some diversity there, but if there's only one female cloning herself completely, and that's the only uh, source of uh, new births, that's going to be a hundred percent identical. So aging is meant to stop her, uh, stop the long living female from contributing too much to the gene pool. And hence menopause. <laughs> yeah, me menopause. There you go. So <laughs> menopause is programmed. So all these things are programmed by evolution to uh, prevent the uh, uh, destruction of gene pool diversity. <laughs> okay, so we're going to encourage people to leave comments and uh, tell us what they think. And we'd like to continue this conversation because as Jeff described before, it's a Rubik's Cube, a lot of moving pieces that we can bring into the discussion. There are more and more papers being written that we can um, bring to this and maybe perhaps interview a few other people that are interested in this arena. So Jeff, do you have anything else to say in closing? Well, if you'd like to read the paper or my blog post that describes all this in a little more detail and has some fun pictures, uh, you can go to my website, Jeff T. Bowles, B-O-W-L-E-S dot com. There's no spaces. It's just Jeff T. Bowles dot com. And check the English blog posts on the first group of blog posts. You'll see one titled The Missing Half of the Theory of Evolution, What Darwin Did Not See. That, that'll that'll some, uh, give you much more detailed information about, about the apes theory, aging, predation, extinction, and sex. Well, thank you very much. This has been great fun. Let's do it again soon. All right. Thank you very much. Talk to you soon.